Welcome to Kingdom Compliance with Dr. James Bruton, offering biblical guidelines, principles of the kingdom of heaven that will help you stay tuned in to the frequency of heaven and reap the benefits that accompany you as a citizen of the kingdom. The best the king has to offer. Today's topic is Kingdom Deeds. I received a prophetic word in November of 2001 that said, For the Lord said, You've moved for me, you've gone forth for me, you've stood for me, now I'm going to establish movement in your life with a steady pace. I submit to you that this prophetic word speaks volumes about deeds, things done, good works, and consistent activity for advancement of God's kingdom on earth and how God rewards those who steadfastly proclaim and accomplish things done for the manifestation of the advancement of his kingdom on earth. Basically, deeds are things done, good or bad. However, for our purpose, we will focus primarily on the good since kingdom deeds are God deeds and all God deeds are good. Psalm chapter 105 verse 1 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. The Hebrew word translated deeds is ma'asa, which means an action, good or bad, a transaction, activity, a product, or property. The Greek word translated deeds is ergon, which means to work, toil as an effort or occupation, a deed, labor, work. In the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 19 through 21, a reference to bad or evil deeds, Jesus had this to say. And this is a condemnation that the light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. The kingdom of God is about good deeds because God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And Jesus is the true light which, coming into the world, gives light to all people. But evil deeds are done in darkness rather than light because evil loves darkness. But he who does good deeds comes to the true light so his deeds may be clearly seen as opposed to obscured or dim that they have been done in God, that is, according to the principles of the kingdom of heaven. As born-again believers, our good deeds are good when the will of God is the rule of them and the glory of God the result of them, and when they are done in his strength and for his sake, to honor him and not to honor men. Kingdom deeds are about present achievements and future action. In other words, Kingdom deeds are consistent because they are a part of the true believer's lifestyle. On the other hand, evil deeds proceed from an evil nature whose parentage is of the devil. Acts chapter 7 verse 22 lets us know that Moses was well studied. Listen to this. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Concerning the apostle Paul, whom the Corinthians charged with writing weighty and powerful letters while railing him in this regard to his personal weakness, Paul writes, and this is coming from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 10 and 11. Paul writes, for his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Let such a person consider this, that what we are in word by letters when we are absent, such we will also be indeed when we are present. Paul's adversaries, many of them professional orators, used this ploy to attack Paul's credibility. But Paul's manner of speaking was quite different. It was plain. It was straightforward and free from artificiality, which meant his opponents tried to help or present what Paul spoke about Christ and the gospel of the kingdom as worthless gibberish. But it was never Paul's intent to use his apostolic authority in a manner that was not constructive. Instead, Paul focused his authority for building up, not destructive, for pulling down. The demands he makes in his letters are written so that the Corinthians may put right what is wrong and improper in their local assembly and so that things may be in order for his arrival, thus removing the need 
for severe action and preparing the way for edifying the people through his teaching. But in coming to Corinth, Paul had purposely averted academic eloquence and wisdom and was determined to proclaim the message of Christ crucified. And the transformed lives of the Corinthian believers testified to the divine power with which he spoke. Now, I'll use 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5 as a primary support to show Paul's good deeds in spite of being persecuted. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. This is the kingdom deal, okay? It's a kingdom deed, and that's what Paul is setting up for us. So Paul lets the Corinthians know that Christ, in his person, in his offices, and even in his sufferings, is the total substance of the gospel. Paul preached the whole counsel of God and did not leave out other parts of God's revealed truth and will. When nothing but Christ crucified is plainly preached, the success must be entirely from divine power, which accompanies the word. And so men are brought to believe to the salvation of their souls. Like Apostle Paul, every born-again believer should display kingdom deeds, things done, good works, and consistent activity for advancement of God's kingdom on earth. Throughout Jesus' life on earth, he displayed kingdom deeds, miracles, signs, and wonders that even his most harsh critics could not deny. Jesus constantly faced critics, opponents of the kingdom deeds which were a part of his divine nature. At one of the winter feasts of dedication in Jerusalem, Jesus faced opposition regarding the good deeds he had done. Let's take a look at a sequence in which Jesus faced opposition from those opposed to his kingdom deeds. First, let's take a look at John chapter 10, verses 30 through 38. I and my father are one. Then the Jews took up stones against him to stone him. Jesus answered them, many good works, many good deeds have I shown you from my father. For which of those works or deeds do you stone me? The Jews answered him saying, for a good work or a good deed, we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I said you are God's. If he called them God's to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you're blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God? If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Notice, first of all, that Jesus said something that offended the Jewish leaders to the point that they took up stones to stone him. Jesus said, I and my father are one. With that statement, Jesus claimed divine power and perfection equally with the father. Christ's works of power and mercy, his kingdom deeds, proclaim him to be God who is blessed forevermore, that all may know and believe he is in the father and the father in him. The father was in the son so that by divine power, which is the Holy Spirit, Jesus performed his miracles. The Son was so in the Father that he knew the whole of his mind. The Greek word translated one in verse 30 is heis, which means one in contrast to many. Metaphorically, it implies union and concord, a single one, one thing, not one person, but one in essence or nature. Not believing that Jesus was one with the Father the Jews took Jesus' words as blasphemy and prepared to carry out the law, though without due process. However, Jesus pointed them back to his good deeds on purpose. He wanted the Jews to make the distinction between good deeds and blasphemy, which of course they never did. Jesus said, many good works I have shown you from my father, for which of those works do you stone me? All of Jesus' good deeds in general, were fine and noble in character, so the Jews couldn't actually fault Jesus for doing good deeds. 
And so the Jews countered, telling Jesus his good works had nothing to do with the stoning. The stoning, in accordance with the law, is because of blasphemy. Because you, being a man, make yourself God. The Jewish leaders correctly understood the thrust of Jesus' words, but their preconceptions and unbelief prevented them from accepting his claim as true. Then Jesus points the Jews back to the law of Moses, of which they were supposed to be experts. Jesus quotes Psalm 82, 6, which says, I said, you are gods. Now, paraphrasing, this is what Jesus must have said. As Jesus said, that's what's written in your law. And the scripture cannot be broken. So how can you stone me for blasphemy when I said I am the son of God? Because that's what your law says. If there's any sense in which men can be spoken of as gods, as Psalm 82, 6 speaks of human rulers or judges whose tasks were divinely appointed, how much more may the term be used of him whom the father set apart and sent into the world? Jesus. So here's the clincher. Jesus tells the Jews, I do the works my father does, the kind of works of compassion that the father himself does. So if I don't do the works of my father, don't believe me. But if I do, even if you don't believe me, believe the works, the good deeds, the kingdom deeds. You see, the kingdom deeds, the miracles, were a part of Jesus' works. It was Jesus' quality of life, not people's inability to explain his miracles, which he primarily spoke of in our text from John chapter 10. Now, let's look at a sequence of events that took place after Jesus' resurrection, where a reference regarding his kingdom deeds is recorded. This took place on the road to Emmaus, after Jesus' resurrection and prior to Jesus' ascension. From Luke chapter 24, let's read verses 13 through 21. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was, while they conversed in reason, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was, watch this, a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Notice something here. Notice that the two disciples who were traveling the same day after Jesus' resurrection on the road to Emmaus, only seven miles from Jerusalem, they were kept from recognizing him by divine intervention. Jesus joined them and inquired as to why their conversation made them sad. Then Cleopas made reference to Jesus as being a stranger in Jerusalem, not knowing the things that had happened there over the last few days. So watch this. Jesus plays along. Jesus plays along and says, what things? This question gave Jesus an opportunity to hear a response from the mouth of these two disciples, what they knew and believed about him. Plus, this question opened the door for Jesus to minister to them about himself and what they'd read about him in the scriptures, but didn't understand. Here's the two disciples' testimony concerning Jesus. They answered him and said, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. The two disciples had respect for Jesus as a man of God and confirmed that he was indeed a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people. But after his death, they apparently were reluctant to call him Messiah, since they had hoped Jesus was the person who was going to redeem Israel. They thought Jesus would set up a Jewish political nation free from Roman rule and usher in the kingdom of God. Therefore, his death was a tragedy in their minds. And so their conversation was of the same sad tone until Jesus, who is light, illuminated their minds 
expounding to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. This exposition of the scriptures was yet another kingdom deed. So even after Jesus' resurrection, he continued to perform kingdom deeds. The two disciples, who were once sad concerning what had happened to Jesus, were now elated. Jesus had enlightened their mind through the scriptures concerning himself. He said in verse 32, And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? Like Jesus, all born-again believers should abound in kingdom deeds. Remember, deeds are things done, good or bad. And kingdom deeds are all good all the time. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18 says, My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. In all things, spiritually mature believers should show themselves to be a pattern of good deeds that not only illuminate and enlighten the minds of non-believers, but also of baby Christians as well. This we do in expounding the scriptures, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that anyone who opposes our good deeds and work to advance the kingdom of God on earth may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say about us. The opposite is to do bad deeds, which will be judged, of course, by God. God will call to mind the bad deeds which men have done, opposing his kingdom with malicious words from a prideful heart. As the word of God says in 3 John verse 11, Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil has not seen God. The doctrine of grace and salvation by the gospel is for all ranks and conditions of men. It teaches to forsake sin, to have nothing to do with it anymore. An earthly sensual conversation does not suit a heavenly calling. However, a holy calling teaches believers to be conscious of that which is good. We must look to God in Christ as the object of our hope and worship. Our conversation must be a godly conversation. It is our duty to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. Notwithstanding all the snares and temptations and corrupt examples, ill usage, and what remains of sin in the believer's heart with all their hindrances, and at the glorious appearing of Christ, the blessed hope of Christ-like believers will be complete. Jesus Christ loved us and gave himself for us. And what can we do less than love and give up ourselves to him by rendering good deeds? We are a peculiar people unto God, free from guilt and condemnation, and purified by the Holy Spirit. And the further we are removed from boastful and prideful works or trusting in them, to performing good deeds and kingdom work from our inner nature so that we glorify in Christ alone, the more zealous we will be to abound in true kingdom deeds and good works. Born again believers, sons and daughters of God, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, should deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, live soberly in moderation, righteously and godly in this present age as we look for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Kingdom deeds point us directly to Christ. If you would like to refer this episode to others, click on share and subscribe to the YouTube channel to stay up to date when new episodes drop. Thanks for joining me. I'm glad you did. I hope you join me next time for Kingdom Compliance with Dr. James Bruton, where we stay tuned in to the frequency of heaven.